Well, here we are gathered for worship on the last Sunday of November. You may still have leftover turkey and stuffing and all the other stuff uh, cooling in your fridge or freezer. But Thanksgiving is officially over. And you and your credit cards may be recovering. But Black Friday is officially over as well. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, the beginning of a four week season of watching and waiting for the coming of Christ. In fact, that's what the word Advent means, coming. And when we use it in the church, we use it to refer to both the first and second coming of Christ. Will you pray with me, please? May the sounds of Advent stir a longing in your people, O oh God. Come again to set us free from the dullness of routine and the poverty of our imaginations. Break the patterns which bind us to small commitments and to the stale answers we have given to questions of no importance. Let the advent trumpet blow, let the walls of our defenses crumble and make a place in our lives for the freshness of your love, well lived in the spirit and still given to all who know their need and dare to receive it. Amen. Prayer from Howard Thurman in the mood of Christmas. In his beautiful book of contemplation in the shelter, Irish poet and theologian and conflict mediator, Padraig Otuama asks a question I've been thinking about for several weeks. How do we live honestly in our own skin? How do we accept what's in front of us? How do we guard against numbness and denial and despair and light of all that assails us? How do we be fully present in the here and now? The Advent Gospel readings are often calls to serious reflection on justice, lifestyle, action. But here in Luke, we're hearing the words of Jesus in Jerusalem during the time of crucifixion. The widow has just put her mite in the collection box. Jesus has been irked by the ways in which she's been manipulated into giving all, while those with plenty are giving so very little. And then he speaks words, words of apocalypse. Now apocalypse is not so much foretelling of the future, even though it might sometimes sound like that. Apocalypse is a word from the theater, pulling back the curtain. Apocalypse reveals what is happening right now. It shows where the concern of God is directed in the present moment. And the call is always to see, respond, act, change, and live a new life. Advent is a season of preparation before the joy celebration of Christmas. And it's not a gentle journey. Advent asks for important reckonings about our lives and the state of our world. In this, week, in this week's readings from Luke and Jeremiah, you know, Jesus talks about what we would consider end times or his return. This is something we read into this. Depending on one's tradition, there are different ways that the end times have been discussed. Now, certainly in the first hundred years of the young Christian communities, it was thought that Jesus would return immediately. When he didn't, a crisis emerged and the people had to re-examine their theologies of death, of being on the earth, of living a resurrection. Now, in the past 100 years, there have been an increase of more than 30 incidents in the imagination of people 
that say that Jesus is returning soon and they have gathered in places for the immediate now. And this, of course, has led to some dramatic showdowns and some of which we've already witnessed. And of course, some very disappointed people. Jesus challenges us to name and to welcome the here, the eternal now as Tillich it calls it. Even when the here and now is perilous and apocalyptic. In prophetic language that sounds distressing, distressingly contemporary, but Jesus, Jesus describes a world reeling in pain. Roaring seas, distress among nations, people fainting in fear. When you see these things, Jesus says, don't turn away, don't hide, don't use faith to abscond or abdicate from such events because it's only when they embrace and we embrace in reality and be attentive to these signs, the events that happen in the here and now, that's when we will acknowledge and welcome the here of human suffering. We will experience the nearness of God. Life is fragile. We live under looming threat, a real world collapses. From climate change to gun violence, to the travesty of Kyle Rittenhouse and the tragedy of Ahmad Avery. From food shortages, supply disruptions, higher prices, inflation, and yet more wars in national quarantines. Even, even this week, the World Health Organization is warning about a new coronas, coronavirus variant, Omicron, which seems to have come out of Africa and now out of Europe and giving scientists and health experts something more to worry about. That is this variant different or so different? Will the present vaccines be enough? With this continued specter of pandemic, we have all come down with a mild case of the blues. And in such instances, it really is common for us to reach for things to shield us from the terror of our awareness that everything can come to an end without notice. And Jesus says, be careful, be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. Now these words suggest a chronological expectation but Jesus' immediate audience did not see the events described in any sort of literal sense. You know, an ancient imagination, a tradition, the roaring and tossing of the sea symbolized an existential category of chaos. And unless the historians missed it, that age has passed into the next. Without the heaven shaking, the celestial bodies emitting irregularities, or the Son of Man surfing the clouds in unvarnished power. Jerusalem fell, as reflected in this story of anticipation from Luke's Gospel, written after the fall of Jerusalem. The Roman Empire met its demise, but the new world of nations continued to proliferate, to change, to grow, to ebb. Violence, inequality, exploitation, all of that continued.
As a child, Advent was never one of my favorite seasons. I preferred Christmas to be moved up as quickly as possible. Although I did like the Advent calendar. We got one every year. And I don't know where um, mom found them, but um, I thought the chocolate was pretty good. You know, we'd take out the, the chocolate for each day, or some days I would skip ahead. Some days I just ate the whole thing. But as I've gotten older, I've come to love the holy season we're now entering. I love that the gospel gets us started this week with images, not of swaddling clothes or twinkly stars or fleecy lambs, but of the world as it really is, the here and now. Gorgeous, frail, terrifying, falling apart. And most of all, I love that we're invited to slow down, to be intentionally quiet in mind and spirit as we reflect on the coming of the Christ child. American novelist Flannery O'Connor once wrote, to the hard of hearing you shout, and for the almost blind, you draw large and startling figures. This is what Christ did for us. This is what Jesus does in his prophetic wake up call. He shouts, he draws startling figures. He uses every rhetorical device at his disposal to snap his listeners into and to attention. Be on guard, he warns. Be alert, stand up, raise your heads, look. What if the symbolism of Jesus depiction of the hopeful chaos is not about some distant time or ultimate endings? What if Jesus is snatching us out of our desire for another world by asking, uh, asking us to face the jarring details of this one. I see Jesus making a case about the fierce need for people of faith to show up each day with stamina and courage. A lack of awareness of our finitude pushes us to act in ways opposed to the call to abundant life in the here and now. For some Christians, salvation has morphed into an intentional escape from the present, alleviating them from any responsibility for themselves, for others, and for our planet. It feels and feeds a narcissistic need for longevity and hero worship beyond the limits of this existence. We run away from the terrors of our eternal now by out believing, out praying, out worshiping, out do-gooding those who are not like us, all as preconditions to live again in some great by and by. Advent is not meant to be a cheery season, even though our television ads would have us believe otherwise. Advent doesn't have the soothing saccharine invitations we like to accept as we shop for gifts and decorate Christmas trees and sing carols. As Episcopal priest Fleming Rutledge reminds us, Advent begins in the dark. It is not a season for the faint of heart. And as the weeks progress, it gets even darker. Be aware, be prepared. Advent is a brutally candid season. 
It calls for honesty, even when honesty leads us straight to lament. In Advent, Advent, we are invited to describe life on earth as it is, and not as we mistakenly assume one's personal beliefs require us to render it. We are invited to shout forth our pain and bewilderment, to name the seemingly absence of God, to draw the large starling figures of the apocalypse. Avoiding all forms of denial, polite piety and cheap cheer, we are invited to allow the radical honesty of scripture to make us honest too. We're asked to stop posturing and pretending, to get over ourselves, to get real. Advent reminds us that we're not called to an escapist denial-based piety. We are called to dwell courageously in truth, however hard that may be. Advent is the season when longing makes sense, when it's okay to say we are hungry, thirsty, lonely, empty, unfinished, or unhoused. In Advent, we want, and we want fiercely. We sit in darkness, longing for light. We sit in exile, longing for a home. We sit with aching, empty arms, longing to cradle a life that's still unformed, still hidden, still in process. In Advent, our desire for God strains towards God's desire for us. During Advent, we live with quiet anticipation of the not yet. That means we wait. And this is not easy, especially in our modern world which applauds arrivals, finish lines, shortcuts, and end products far more than it does the meandering journey or an odd way station. We have games and gadgets and ways of distraction away from the purpose of the intentional reflection of waiting. Eugene Peterson calls this a long obedience in the same direction, waiting. If the secular world speeds past darkness to the safe uncertainty of light, then Advent reminds us that necessary things, things worth waiting for, happen in the dark. Next spring seeds break open in dark winter soil. God's spirit hovers over the dark water preparing to create worlds. The child we wait for grows in the deep darkness of the womb. Our food is expectation, writes Nora Gallagher about Advent. In this season, she says, we strive to find not perfection, but possibility. So during Advent, we're invited to take notice. Now that's hard in this busy world for those who practice Lectio Divina. We're asked if we noticed something, a word, a phrase that speaks to us. when repeatedly reading a scripture passage over and over again, often taking turns. We are invited and encouraged to be fully present, to attend, to look. Look at the fig tree, Jesus says. 
Look at all the trees. Be attentive to the details. Don't theorize. Don't revel in abstraction. Don't assume that God is present only in creed, theory, and doctrine. Look at the sprouting leaves. Notice the changing sky. Attend to the mighty movements of the oceans and the tiny movements of your soul and spirit. The God who shows up in a teenager's womb might show up anywhere. So pay attention. During this first week of Advent, we are called to hope creatively, to hope against the grain. As Barbara Brown Taylor puts it, we're called to trust that darkness does not come from a different place than light. It is not presided over a different God. With our imaginations, we can hold the tension and the grief of our circumstances in the compassion of the Messiah who comes to save us. With our imaginations, we can take the long view, even as we dwell concretely in the here and now. But we are also called to be better and more honest followers of the Christ child of Jesus. These two texts call for us to do many things today. Enactment of justice in light of radical and gender discrimination. Enactment of new lifestyles under the ache of climate emergencies. Reform of government and corporate imaginations and their resource. to reimagine the usage of what our planet gives us because our planet groans for sustainability. We must pay attention to the urgencies of change. It calls for another imagination of time, not just whether we'll be fine in the next 10 years or 20, but whether our children, our grandchildren, or their grandchildren will have a planet that's, in, that's habitable without catastrophic, catastrophe and crises. This takes another imagination of time. But what we are responsible for is the now, the eternal now. We began, as Padre Gautuma writes, by admitting that the rotten fruit of illusion rarely fills us for long. Advent is an antidote to illusion. It cuts to the chase. It insists on truth. It lays us bare. Advent invites us to dwell richly in the here and now, precisely because here is where God dwells when the oceans heave, the ground shakes, and our hearts are gripped by fear. When you see these things, Jesus says, hope fiercely and live truthfully. Deep in the gathering dark, something tender continues to grow. Yearn for it, wait for it, notice it, imagine it, pray for it. Something beautiful, something for the world's saving awaits to be born. I leave you with this poem on the work of Advent in the time of pandemic, inspired by Howard Thurman. When the carols and choirs are stilled, 
When so many dear ones are gone, it seems like the stars have blinked their tears into darkness. When the year has kept so many home and endangered the homes of so many others. When the shepherds of the year are healthcare workers and like those flock keepers long ago, those in essential but poorly honored jobs, the work of Advent begins to find the grieving, the fearful, the lost, to heal those broken in spirit with the story of an unexpected hope in another time of great danger. To feed, clothe, shelter, employ those financially insecure, to release the prisoner, especially those in immigration detention, to rebuild all the nations. Because the epiphany is that great gift comes not out of our own chimneys, but from strangers who live far away to become stable makers that shelter peace, health, wisdom, and care for the earth itself, to sing the carols in our own homes and teach the words that may one tune to someone, perhaps a child, who longs for a new harmony. Amen.